السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ مائی نیم از ڈاکٹر شکیل اختر انصاری اینڈ آئی ایم ورکنگ ایز این اینٹی اسپیشلسٹ ان ان دس ہاسپٹل ای این ٹی اینڈ ہیڈ اینڈ ایک سرجری ڈپارٹمنٹ آئی ویلکم یو آل آف یو فار دس اور اکیڈمک سیشن آف دا گرینڈ آئیکون وچ وی آر سیلیبریٹنگ ناؤ اینڈ ٹوڈے از سپوز ٹو بی دا لاسٹ ڈے of uh, uh, the icon and we are on the closing ceremony we have uh, very strenuous and stretchful uh, icon activities including several workshops on very valiant and very important uh, subjects and uh, now we are on the academic sessions last time we had an academic sessions on archaeologies and uh, now we are conducting on pure or ent Uh, uh, topics which uh, are very much concerns to the ENT surgeons. Uh, I'll just um, tell that our ENT department in the um, uh, in this hospital is uh, has almost grown up now and uh, with a lot of efforts it has been established now and we are providing services for all the subjects and all the um, areas of the ENT. And uh, we wish that we can plan to give all the services under one roof, which has uh, everything to do, uh, particularly with from the basic ENT services to the advanced ENT surgeries, cancers, and uh, some reconstructions, rehabilitations, and whatever we can think for ENT. So we uh, had a struggle, a long struggle, and for the most uh, merciful and most powerful personality of the universe and all the universes rather than with the name of Allah. And uh, we wish that Allah will grant us and all the help from everybody and from uh, from himself to establish the things so i will like to invite my first speaker today the, his name is uh, dr anjum navid got a tremendous experience on ent had uh, got an farcs and uh, he has got the experience of ENT from all parts of the world. He has worked a lot of places, gathered uh, experiences from a lot of places. He has got a very kind personality and very much deeply involved in his subject. So he has got a lot of work in ear and he wished to establish some center to the ear to help the people. So I would like to uh, please invite uh, uh, Dr. Anjum Naveed to please uh, come and uh, demonstrate us about the topic which he have selected is about the ear also. And now uh, today he is just telling us about a very important uh, technique about uh, reaching the mastoids that is an inside approach. So please like to please uh, Dr. Anjum Naveed. Um, my name is Dr. Anjum Naveed. and i am senior consultant in the department of ear nose and throat in the hospital karachi pakistan this is the present project of indus hospital and now it is in this hospital health network and expanded to whole of the country and very soon we will be shifting our new state of the art building which will be having 1500 beds and this is one of the largest charitable institute giving quality of care free of cost. Karachi is famous for many places like food, like Tom of Kade Azam and beautiful beaches. And this is one of the beaches so beautiful that people name it as the paradise point. From last 10 to 20 years, there are a lot of advancement in the middle ear and the mastoid surgery. I have seen the era of uh, hammer and gouge, then microscope, micro drills, and now there is a time for endoscopic ear surgery. 
but still the Kanarwala procedure is quite famous. It is done through the mastoid, outside, inside. But the problem is that there is a big, quite good rate of uh, recurrence and uh, residual plastotoma. And plus, these patients need second year, second look surgery. It is quite impossible in our part of the world. And the second procedure, which is also very common, is the canal down procedure. And no doubt in this procedure, there is a less chance of a residual plastotoma. But the problem is this, this uh, patients have uh, a whole life come for follow-up and most of the time the stride cavity is filled with debris and bags. But there's another approach which I prefer is the combination of canal up and canal down procedure and this can be inside out mastoid. The advantage is, is that it is less invasive because not every patient with cholesterol need complete full-blown mastoidectomy. In this procedure, we follow the disease from the attic to the interim and see all the landmarks of the surgery at the beginning so that the injury to the vital structure is quite less. So if the disease is limited to the attic, then we do the atticotomy, clean the disease, do osseal plasty, and cover this area with conical cartilage. The patient has a quite very good results after this operation. But if the disease crosses the attic and, and aditus, and then to the antrum and going toward the mastoid tip, uh, we remove the disease and follow uh, and follow the sac so that once the whole disease has been removed and then we stop it. And the end result is that small cavity, which you can see. Before starting this procedure, I would like to enumerate the anatomy Capital tympana. Capital tympana forms the upper third of the tympanic cavity. The tympanic cavity is usually 10 millimeter in diameter, and if you can see the about three and a half millimeter is the uh, attic area. So it has quite good safe margin to dissect it out. Superiorly, it is bounded by the tegment tympani, and inferiorly, it is uh, um, bounded by, by the uppermost part of the Parstensa. Anteriorly is the bone of the middle cranial fossa, posteriorly is the aditus, antrum, and mastoid cavity, medially is the facial nerve, geniculate ganglion, superior and lateral semicircular canals. The contents of the, the epitempanum are the uh, head of the malleus, body of the incus. We see this uh, handle of the malleus. We can always see with our autoscopes and microscope uh, attached with the tip and the brain. But this part of the middle layer contents are hidden by the scutum, which is part of the epithelium. There are many indications for this procedure, uh, like retraction pockets, is a very common problem here. We follow the detection pocket with this approach and move it and give very good results. And of course, if there's a clostoma, granulation, so we follow the disease. And sometimes we see that the massive tuberous sclerosis fixing the ossicle. We can carefully uh, remove this fixation by this approach. And I found that this approach is very good for the compression of the horizontal part of the facial nerve. Before doing any mastoid or middle ear surgery, we always do pure tone autogram that give us assessment of the hearing levels in both ears. And my suggestion, I always do before any mastoid surgery, CT of the temporal plane or the contrast. And that gives me a root map for this uh, surgery. May have sometime you, it can bond you if there's a Dyson jubilar bulb, Dyson uh, sigmoid sinus wall, Dyson tagment. And also give the sizes of the antrum, uh, facial nerve, and fistula of the lateral canal. So this is a very important investigation, and same as we do before doing the functional endoscopic surgery. MRI scan is reserved for if there is a recurrent clostoma or the application. The 
middle surgery and mastoid surgery is the surgery of the landmarks. Follow the landmarks from the beginning, the rate of complication is very less. We, first of all, we clean the extraordinary canal, inspect the ear canal, see the depending membrane for any perforation or any pathology on the membrane, and then we see the type of perforation and the condition of the metronia. The first landmark, important landmark is the malleus. You see the malleus is present or absent. Then sometimes the erosion of the attic, and we can see the incus long process. It's intact, loaded, and sometimes the whole incus is absent. Then we see the head of the stapes and see whether the superstructure is present or only we can see the foot plate. Then we see the outer attic wall and the cholesterol in relation. And sometimes this outer attic wall is so much eroded with the inspection of the middle ear, you can find medially the exposed facial nerve. So it can warn you from the beginning. We start with our incision through the canal. I give incision six to eight millimeter above the annulus from six o'clock to 12 o'clock position. This uh, incision usually gives you an idea that how much the barometer flap we have to raise because too much flap causes problem during drilling and too much less flap will, will not be beneficial. We give the post incision, harvest the temporal fascia, then we do the uh, tympanometer flap elevation, identify the annulus first, then quadrant tympani, try to preserve the quadrant tympani and identify the clustoma and retraction pockets uh, and we start the incision from the tip of the hallux to the tip of the mastoid, a few millimeters behind the post oral sulcus. Then we try to take uh, temporal fascia as much as possible. And most of the time, I prefer to take the periosteum, so it's field based periosteum flap, which is very helpful. The second step is the do the canal, bony canaloplasty in which we enlarge the external OTT canal starting from the spine of Hanley overhanging and going from 10 o'clock to 3 o'clock position and take this uh, bone dust and preserve it, but we not open the anterior cells. We protect the dependent flap most of the time by placing a small piece of uh, um, aluminum foil, which is the, you can take out from the uh, micral sutures and that protects the tympanometer flap from your suction enemies. This is, uh, we take about four millimeter drill starting from medial to lateral, seven o'clock to three o'clock and then make the canal wide and flush it in a very absolutely same uh, plane. After that, we change the butt to three millimeter and then go more medially, and thin out the bone very carefully uh, to not to injure the corda and the ossicles and always see your butt in 365 degree direction. Once the bone is more thin, then we convert our butt to two millimeter diamond burr, actual the bone. This is very important because now you are very near to the ossicles and if you drill, touch any ossicle, patient will definitely get the SNZ load having loss. So we action the bone, remove the bone with the curettes, and then we see for any erosion, cholesterol spreading medial and lateral to the ossicles. And most of the time in this position, we see the short process of the incus. We see is eroded, and sometimes you can assess whether the uh, long process of the incus is eroded or not. Feel the distance of tagmen by putting some curved instruments in the direction of the meters so that, uh, you know, the margin of this is really. Removal of bone from medial to lateral direction, increase the size of the aticotomy and go towards the mastoid tip and removing the bone superiorly, posteriorly, anteriorly and inferiorly. We 
explore the sinusoidal angle, follow the disease, the sac of the disease. You can easily separate the sac of the disease from the bone and follow the granulation then blastoma, exposure of sinusoidal angle and mustoid tip till the you get the end of the sac. So once uh, you have removed the sac of the clostridioma, then you then we remove the uh, posterior metal wall, facial ridge till the lateral semicircle canal, and then we clean the middle ear. In the middle ear, very important first of all to see if there is a remnant of the adult stapes are there, and see the facial nerve exposed or not, and also. There are two parts very important which hide the clostridioma, the facial recess, and the sinus symphony, which can be cleaned easily. Once you've uh, cleaned the disease, your cavity is clear, then you do the metoplasty. Metoplasty is a part, very important part of this operation, mostly if there are cavities are very thick. So remove the piece of concrete cartilage. This metoplasty helps in ventilation cleaning and preventing the recurrent infection of the mastoid If we are doing the aticotomy, then we reconstruct, as I said before, with the conical cartilage. Conical cartilage is a very good cartilage, very good contour, and you don't need to have another incision to the editus, to the tragus area, and it will prevent any, any, any detection of pocket formation in the future. If the cavity is moderate size, we obliterate with the bone dust. I say the bone dust is a very important part. Whenever you do any mastoid surgery, always keep some bone dust in reserve. And uh, sometimes we also put some pieces of concrete cartilage, soft tissue. But if the cavity is quite big, then we cover it with the previous periosteal flap. And it's very important before putting this flap, you must sure that you clean all the clostridioma from the mistake. We don't have the facility of the torp and pork, so we use the autologous conical cartilage, but if the incus is free of disease, do the incus transposition for acicloplasty, but I have seen double cartilage graft on the top of the head of the step is very helpful, and if the superstructure of step is absent, then we make a turban graft of the cartilage, conical cartilage, and put it in the foot plate of the Also give result. We close the wound in two layers by subcuticle vitreal sutures, because most of the patients are children. You cannot put uh, proline or silk, so because they will resist and when you remove the stitches. So these stitches are the stitches, and very good. Put the antibiotic pack to be removed after 10 days. Patients kept on systemic antibiotics and after removal of pack for tropical antibiotics for three weeks, follow the patient after 10 days, six weeks, three months, and then the six weeks. The complication rate is quite low in this approach because I said in the beginning, we see the landmarks before drilling the mastoid area so that we can keep them in our under our in our eye and but still sometimes the complications are there like before special love policy that seven circle can have fistula immediately the tegment different and dura and sometimes we need to do sigma sinus but still I would say the complications of this approach are quite less than even cortical mustard the few contraindications of this procedure, if the patient has a massive clostridioma and uh, post-oral fistula, the cavity is already open. If the patient has an asteroid abscess, and also if the, uh, he has exposed tegment tympani, some intercalary complication, and if you are doing a revision mastoidectomy, which the mastoid has already been operated and open, then uh, this approach is not so I will conclude my talk that the main advantages of inside out mastoidectomy is to initiate the surgery from where the disease has started. Instead of removing the significant cortical bone to reach the disease, 
And also, the other main advantage is the ability to identify the tagment equation. Now, that is some sort of at the beginning of the set. The size of cavity is small, can easily be obliterated, which leads to less cavity problems in the future. And also, it gives very good functional and anatomical results. These are the references which I used for my presentation. Thank you very much. I will be happy to answer any questions if you have. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Anjim Naveed. It's uh, really very elaborative and uh, very informative lecture about a very important topic. And I think we all the people used to go every day for our ENT practices. I think everybody would have a lot of benefit for that. So we will uh, just uh, uh, keep on forwards with um, the, the, the other and speaker, with the other speaker of uh, our program. With, with our speaker of our uh, program is that now uh, the uh, cochlear implant is now getting very much in and uh, is a dream for everybody to get involved into the cochlear implant program or a cochlear implant surgeries in the ENT world. It's uh, a new innovation. Uh, no, we can't say that it's a new, but it's very much fastly developing, uh, becoming a need of the society in these days. Our ENT department also has uh, got a good name and got a good uh, position in the e in cochlear implant uh, surgeries. And uh, here, the ENT department of uh, the Indus Hospital is uh, doing from the very scratch from the very beginning to the last end and under one roof giving all the services regarding the cochlear implant uh, surgeries here and uh, as you know that in this hospital is doing it free of cost uh, so it's a big big help to the society and the humanity now the uh, presenter which i would like to invite is uh, uh, i think his work is <clears throat> his self uh, introduction. Dr. Asif Ali Arain, who has been uh, here for about the last four years, was joined uh, in this hospital. And after that, he has really changed the scenario with all his efforts and uh, all his dedications, with all his expertise, which do have, and really turned uh, the ENT department from a very seedlings to a now a well developed, groomed department. His uh, passion is uh, converting into his obsession now and uh, what the struggle he has done it, particularly in the um, field of uh, head and neck surgeries and cochlear implant, which is just adding as a jewel to the crown of the ENT department in this hospital. Uh, Dr. Asif Ali Ryan is a well, is a very young, um, very dedicated, got a lot of expertise in uh, ENT surgeries and uh, he has got very good administrative parts also that abilities are establishing the thing particularly the uh, cochlear implant program in the, the hospitals now we I would like to invite him to you can see about that uh, how the cochlear implant is program is running in in the ENT department in this hospital so uh, my all the uh, respect to Dr. Asif Ali and please continue. Rahim and assalamu alaikum to all of you. 22. Today we will discuss our cochlear implant program at Indus Hospital Karachi. So my name is Dr. Asif Arai and uh, I am uh, I'm working as a consultant in Department of ENT and Head and Neck Surgery. So we will discuss about the cochlear implant program at Indus Hospital. So they start with the definition. The cochlear implant is a surgi surgically placed electronic device that receives sounds and transmit the resulting electronic electrical signals to the electrode implanted in the cochlea of the ear. As all you know, the cochlear implant has two components, the outer component and the inner com component. The outer component is a transmitter and the inner component is a receiver. 
there you can see this is the <clears throat> electrode wire that goes into the cochlea and this is the one and a half turn of cochlea so this uh, so th this uh, this cochlear implant uh, uh, you can say this is uh, also a bionic ear Let's start with the history in 1957 the french was first who who, uh, who attempt to produce the first cochlear implant that was a single channel impl implant and uh, that work was uh, taken by uh, dr william house an uh, otologist considered the inventor of the cochlear implant along with the john doyle uh, neurosurgeon and uh, james doyle an electrical engineer uh, worked together and they made a single channel device it was a single channel device but speech was modulated by 16 hertz in december 1984 the australian cochlear implant was approved by the united states food and uh, drug allergy administration to be implanted in adult also in 1990 the fda lowered the approved age of implantation to two years, then 18 months in 1998, and finally the 12 months in 2000. So nowadays we are doing an implant uh, in, uh, in the children that are more than uh, 12 months and uh, low than uh, four years. So we have a proper selection criteria at the Indus Hospital. Uh, in uh, in adult and the children before we were doing only implant in the in the children's but now from this year we have started this program for the adult also in the children uh, the age is uh, 12 months or uh, 12 months above than 12 months and below four years and they are lingually deaf child at the birth the cochlea is fully formed that is uh, that is proven by ct scan and mri Postlingual child, if there is, there is no age limit. Assessment by the speech, and there is very necessarily that uh, every patient should go and uh, uh, go for, go with the with the speech therapist assessment, audiology and uh, uh, psychological assessment. In adult, if postlingual, there is no age, age limit, and uh, the, except then any medical issue. Selection criteria of deaf uh, uh, deaf children also, if there is profound sensory, sensory neural hearing loss, more than 90 decibel. And first of all, we give the hearing trial. And if those who do not benefit from the hearing aid uh, for three to six month trial, that we select them for the for the candidate of the cochlear implant. There is, there is absolute contraindication if there is cochlear aplasia or absent cochlear nerve, uh, 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 absent cochlear nerve. So in adult criteria, if the patient who have severe or profound hearing loss with PTA of 70 decibel or greater uh, hearing lever, little or no benefit from the hearing aids, added score on open set sentence less than 50%, and there is no evidence of central centrally auditory lesion no medical or radiological contraindication of the surgery so uh, uh, preoperative evaluation of the of the cochlear implant uh, patients is very necessary so for in the indus hospital first of all we start with the detailed history clinical examination and there is a co collaborative uh, efforts involving the patient family patient himself, a school, audiologist, a speech language pathologist, surgeon, and psychologist. And candidate must undergo audiological testing and a speech therapy for the evaluation of that. Candidates also recommend to undergo hearing aid trial to test whether hearing aids are sufficient or an, uh, or an implant may be more beneficial for them. Psychological assessment is very necessarily and uh, and uh, and the uh, need for the patient who they are going for the cochlear implant, and uh, we we go by every individual, 
and uh, per, uh, and uh, we we identify the every subject who have an organic brain dysfunction who they have uh, mental retardation undetected psychosis unrealistic uh, uh, expectation either by himself patient himself or family and information related to family dynamics and other factor in the patient family that may affect the implant acceptance and performance should be addressed before the implant so these are the tests, <clears throat> routine tests we are doing for, to, to, to assess the, the, the degree of hearing loss and the, the candidacy of uh, uh, cochlear implant. So these tests are audiological assessment, including PTA, uh, speech audiometry, added audiometry, uh, BARA, and autoacoustic emissions. For evaluation, uh, after complete assessment by the by the audiologist, speech language pathologist, ENT surgeon, uh, so we we recommend each and every patient should uh, go for a CT scan and MRI. In the CT scan, we usually uh, see and detect the anomaly of bony labyrinth, and if there is a narrow internal artery meatus, large vestibular equiduct, facial nerve dehiscence low lying dura and high jugular bulb so these all things we have to see in the ct scan and accordingly we plan our surgery uh, for the safety of the patient so mri is also very necessary part of of the cochlear implant program uh, and uh, for the for the for the candidate of the cochlear implant to detect the labyrinthine ossification early fibrotic uh, obstruction, identification of cochlear agenesis, cochlear nerve agenesis, potency of cochlear duct, acoustic tumors, and any CNS abnormalities if patient have. Contraindication of the cochlear implant, if there is, uh, there are, there are uh, absolute contraindication uh, in which there is a deafness due to the eighth nerve uh, in the eighth nerve lesion or brainstem lesion. There is uh, there is eighth nerve atresia, agenesis of the cochlea like mickle deformity, uh, active and middle ear mastoid infection, severe organic brain dysfunction, severe mental retardation, psychosis, unrealistic expectation of the patient or the patient family, and relative indication is tympanic membrane perforation. Before, uh, for this, we have to address the tympanic membrane perforation before the surgery or at the time of the surgery to repair it. So always this is the this is the question. So, so this is my always. I I ask my juniors. Uh, so whenever there is there is uh, there is a need to the implant. So which year you will select? So in in our uh, opinion, and I always recommend to go for the better hearing ear. So there is a concept of to uh, concept that the, we have to preserve as much as residual hearing and boost up the residual hearing as much as we can. And uh, the most uh, and other thing is that if there is uh, two years and uh, uh, from the two years, there, there should be a most recently deaf ear should be addressed uh, before if there is, uh, there is a degree of hearing loss is same. And also, we it's depend upon the radiological investigation. As I told you, the anatomy is a major part in the in the implantation of the cochlear implant, and uh, we have to see that there is uh, there is a pneumatization of uh, mastoid uh, should be normal, normal facial nerve anatomy, normal inner inner ear anatomy, and patent cochlea, and least obstruction of the labyrinth. So here I will show you some CT scans. So this is the normal CT scan. Here you can see usually uh, what I see in the CT scan, I told you before that uh, degree of the nematization is very important whenever you are selecting for. So always I, I select the uh, well nematized uh, 
uh, mess right and also i prefer there there is uh, uh, there is uh, 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 anatomy of the uh, preference seed that what is the anatomy of uh, facial nerve and what is the position of the uh, dura and sigmoid sinus so here you can see this is the cochlea the malleus and uh, tympanic uh, tensor tympani hypotympanum and uh, in this picture, you can see in the facial nerve and relation of facial nerve with the cochlea and the jugular foramina. And also very important landmark that is internal acoustic meters. And uh, it's uh, wide or narrow that give, give you an idea about the agenesis of cochlear nerve. So here are the picture of uh, uh, complete uh, ossifying cochlea. This is enlarged vestibular equiduct. And here you can see an internal uh, acoustic meatus. So here you can see the normal and uh, there is uh, hypoplastic or uh, uh, agenesis of the cochlear nerve. There is degree of uh, around in these kind of uh, uh, CT scan, there is 95% chances that there is agenesis of cochlear nerve. So come up with the with the surgical procedure. So I will I will uh, I will uh, give some tips and how we are performing the surgery and what are the technique, what what should be the but what should be the need of surgery in the cochlear implant. So we will go with this step by step. So uh, first of all, dress, uh, position, positioning and prep and wrap is very important. So usually I prep a uh, uh, patient like this to, to make uh, four sheets uh, around the, the ear to expose the, the external uh, part of the uh, posterior and tear part of the pinna. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, after that, uh, <clears throat> the positioning i usually i i use head ring without the without the shoulder roll and uh, after that we we do the uh, template uh, imaging so uh, this is the template this is for the ear and this is for the for the processor uh, uh, so after that uh, line after that positioning and uh, and uh, template lining uh, the incision is very important some people are using c-shaped incision some, some using long incision usually in my practice i'm using a, a two to three centimeter incision behind the post auricular area and uh, and here you can see that this is the this is the imaginary line of that incision that usually we are using for so i use 15 blade uh, for the start of uh, this before that we we inject a local zalokin with adrenaline and uh, with the 15 blade uh, incision is uh, given during surgery it's uh, uh, during surgery we usually avoid uh, uh, the uh, electric cautery and uh, bipolar cautery is uh, usually we are using. So uh, in this picture, after incision, expose the mastoid area. And so <clears throat> usually I start with the center of uh, this uh, mastoid cavity uh, just behind the spine of Henle. So I start drilling from the center and uh, the concept is that so here you can see there is a hypo nematization average nematization and well nematized so usually i start with the center as i told you and uh, with the with the <clears throat> nematization i i increase my my cavity accordingly so here you can see what is the reason i start with the center so here you can see that there, there is the lower line dura so if you if you start with the center and you will follow the mastoid nematization and just go entirely with it, so you will be safe for that. And after 
uh, cortical mastoidectomy, all as you know, the cortical mastoidectomy, we will do it. And after the cortical mastoidectomy, the first uh, landmark usually I am using for that is the lateral semicircular canal. This is the hard uh, bone, and uh, this is uh, very much appreciated. Uh, uh, by the by, by, by the color, uh, this is uh, uh, yellowish, hard in color. So we we look uh, look uh, in uh, look for this lateral semicircular canal before uh, as a first landmark after the after the cortical mastoidectomy. Here you can see the relationship. This is uh, this is posterior tympanotomy. So there is some anatomy of the posterior tympanotomy. Here you can see the lateral semicircular canal. This is the facial nerve. This is the corda tympani nerve, and this is the stapes and the stapedial, stapedial muscle uh, uh, attachment for it. So here you can see in this is the. In this picture, uh, just uh, this is the sigmoid sinus. Just you find it posteriorly and inferiorly for that. This is this is the direction of sigmoid sinus. This is the temporal uh, lobe and low lying dura or tegmen, and this is the area of the the mastoid antrum and the area of the facial nerve. Usually, uh, I am doing this uh, this facial nerve exposure by the by the using of diamond burr, the diamond burr should be either three or size four diamond burr, and uh, and uh, with the gentle hands and uh, with the with the with with just like uh, brushing on that area to step by step expose it and be meticulous on these area. The facial nerve is very precious, and we have to take care of it. So after that. So uh, as I told you in my previous picture, first landmark is the lateral semicircular canal. And after finding the lateral semicircular canal, we have to follow the nematized cell some superiorly and interiorly. And here you can see we have a second landmark. This is the short process of incus. So this is the second landmark we have to identify. And this is the area where you will find the facial nerve. This is the area. And here you will find in between, usually it's a, it's a crude area. This is the line. If you would draw the imaginary line in between the uh, short process of uh, incus and lateral semicircular canal in between here so this is the area i will can i can tell you and the direction of the of the uh, of the drilling should be should be from superior to inferior but that should be very gentle and meticulous here you can see another picture the relationship of the facial nerve with the with the other. So these are the landmark, as I told you, the facial nerve, the short process of uh, incus and lateral semicircular canal. These are the <clears throat> clear picture. This is the posterior tympanotomy approach. So we have to go after that. We have to go for the posterior tympanotomy approach. So posterior tympanotomy approach, uh, posteriorly is the facial nerve, anteriorly is the corda tympani, and you have to see the 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 <clears throat> the stapedial uh, tendon and the stapes foot plate and uh, promontory and under uh, and promontory and under the promontory is uh, round window niche and you have to found the the round window over there so this is one of our patient picture so this is the corda tympani this is the facial nerve this is the lateral semicircular canal, and this is the short process of incus. You see, I start usually, I start uh, uh, near and leave this buttress there and near towards the upper side, near towards the, 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 the short process of incus. So here, if I open here, I will just, I showed in the previous uh, picture that I showed you, in my previous picture, as I showed you, that uh, that these are the landmarks. Usually, usually we identify during during these these procedures. So uh, this is the this is the posterior tympanotomy approach. So in between the 
in between the uh, corda tympani and the facial nerve. So we have to expose the facial nerve first. In the in the advanced center, usually there are the facial nerve monitors, but uh, unfortunately uh, we don't have. So we we are using our expertise to go with it and just drill drill direction should be like this and we have to identify first of all usually i identify the the stapes and uh, stapedial muscle uh, and then the promontory and underneath the promontory is the round window niche so so uh, and accordingly with the need you can uh, you can uh, be, uh, you can increase the size of your posterior tympanotomy usually i am making uh, so the size of uh, posterior tympanotomy around 0 0.8 cm to 1.2 cm and uh, after that round round window niche should be identified and uh, and here is the the oval window <laughs> usually during the during the procedure this is the most venerable part of uh, of uh, facial nerve where it can be injured so be uh, be careful when you are using the bar uh, especially at that top part because it's taking taking little bit uh, curve to upper side so the so and avoid uh, avoid the cutting bar at uh, at that side so this is the picture you can see so uh, uh, this is the uh, mostly venerable part so we can injure the the facial nerve at that side so this is a picture of another of our patient uh, this is this uh, this is the classic landmarks this is the lateral semicircular canal this is the uh, this is the tegment tympani and it's uh, the the mastoid uh, <coughs> cavity leads into the uh, adetus uh, uh, and uh, this is the short process of uh, um, incus and this is the stapes, uh, stapes uh, muscle and stapes uh, uh, bone. And here is the, this one above is the, the promontory. And that was a round window that I opened it, a round window niche, and then I opened it. And there is a membrane and I opened this membrane. This is now the opening of the uh, round window that leads towards the cochlea. So after making this, this round window uh, round window over there uh, opening of the round window and uh, we then the next step to make the bed for the implant so we have to seal these areas and go for the bed for the implant so usually we have a template and we are using this template to make the make the make the impression for that usually i i make the bed for it and also make the canal so we we sharpen the edges of canal on the both side that implant uh, uh, electrode wire should go inside and uh, and uh, 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 in this picture i can see it. so this is these are the these are the area so there is a, there is a sharpen edges and underneath is the is the area so i will put these implant uh, wire on the under surface so one wire this is the base wire that goes into the into the into the flap uh, underneath the flap and this is the implant as uh, it's as you can see that it's going inside the the oval window uh, there is two approaches also one is the uh, sorry round window one is the round window approach and other is the is the cochleostomy approach so the cochleostomy usually we are using interior and fairly at the promontory and we start uh, drilling over there and uh, we 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 identify uh, the area of the cochlea over there so other approach is the round window uh, approach that is uh, we identify the round window niche expose the round window open the round window uh, membrane and then insert the implant over there so after that we close this uh, this wound uh, in two layers the uh, one uh, by the three zero vicral and uh, so upper surface of the wound is uh, is closed by four zero uh, rapid 
and this is the closure of the wound. You can see the size of the wound. And after the closure, we have to go for uh, impedances, impedances and NRT to check the position of the implant. And uh, 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 NRT, uh, uh, check the position of implant by the by the x-ray uh, uh, x-ray uh, and also the nrt and the impedances should be done during during the, the surgical procedure so uh, thanks to all of you this is my mentor dr uh, professor saim lukman and uh, other friends and faculty from the Indus Hospital and outside the Indus Hospital. I'm very thankful to all of you for your uh, kind presence and uh, for the listening of this lecture. So thanks to all of you. Uh, any question, please, you are welcome for that. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Asif, for giving such an elaborative and very much explanative uh, lecture about the so much important um, procedures of cochlear implantations and uh, about the way you have described that how the department of ENT is progressing and going about ahead. We wish you and the ENT department and in this hospital a very much uh, um, welcome and inshallah God will progress us and take to you what you dreamed for. So, uh, stepping forward, uh, we know that in the, or as the, I will say it as the curse of uh, all the third world country is all this beetleness and uh, this, this pawn and uh, smoking and bad oral hygiene is all leading to different sorts of diseases in which the very much abundant diseases which all used to face in the ENT clinics is uh, the cancers so the cancers of the oral cavity is the is the biggest curse to our society and uh, since uh, we know that it's very destructive and the uh, treatment for that is very expensive for uh, getting treated so uh, the people who are suffering they don't afford it so we need a very very big uh, it is for these issues to elaborate, to convince the people and to acknowledge them and to educate them for all the things which they should not that think they should not take what is leading to the cancers. You know, for uh, um, for Karachi people or even Karachi and all over the Pakistan, uh, Jinnah Postgraduate Medical Center is a well-known institute and we call it as a parent institute for a lot of lot of ENT world which has been working in Pakistan in particular. So the ENT department of the Jinnah Hospital is a very big department, very busy and is giving a lot of services to the society. To head this department is really uh, something I could call it's a very prestigious and a matter of uh, a great responsibility to the society and to the department. So the man which I used will call now is heading that department of ENT and head and neck surgeries of Jinnah Postgraduate Medical Center. This is Dr. Abdul Razak Dober. Abdul Razak Dober is, is also very young, energetic, and uh, uh, very cooperative and uh, very much uh, dedicated to his work. And he is really progressed in a very short period of time. Uh, to the position which he got now. And I would rather say that it's really a big position of big responsibility. And we are seeing that he is fulfilling these responsibilities. So uh, Dr. Abdurazak Rudogar will just tell us about uh, the cancers of the oral cavities and about the remedies and incidences and hopes for the preventions uh, about it. So I would like to invite Dr. Abdurazak to so please kindly uh, present his uh, lectures to us to get benefited. Thank you very much. Welcome, Dr. Abdul Razak. Uh, my name is Dr. Razak Dogar, in charge uh, Department of ENT JPMC Karachi. Today we are presenting a very uh, common topic. As we know, a lot of people and a lot of patients came to us with a complaint of the carcinoma of the cheek. Now, in this present, in this present, in this presentation, uh, we are discussing. Uh, when patient came to us with a complaint of uh, cheek growth, how his presentation 
what is the presentation of the patient and what are the incidents of this patient in our society or especially tertiary care hospital uh, at JPMC Karachi. As we know the anatomy of the bucket mucosa and cheek, uh, as we know uh, the mucosa of the cheek, the buccal cavity may extend from the buccal surface of the lips, up, uh, up uh, lips, cheeks up to the terigo mandibular raphi oral commission and up to the retro mandibular trigon area. The lining epithelium of the consist of uh, cheek mucosa is non stated uh, non keratinized uh, stratified stratified non keratinizing squamous lining. Uh, after the uh, epithelium of that, uh, we are going to the submucosa. Then we are going to the buccal fat, which is very important for our surgical point of view and our uh, for the invasion of the tumor also. After the buccal fat, as we know, the anatomy uh, buccinator muscle, which help, uh, uh, will help the patient or uh, uh, of the human uh, to the uh, buccinator uh, uh, muscle about uh, buccinator of the uh, things. We, uh, we are swimming the th things and we are swallowing. After the buccinator muscle, uh, we are going to the uh, artery supply of the uh, buccal cheek or cheek. As we know, the, the common artery supply uh, multiple branches of the facial artery, which is, which is branch of the common carotid artery. Uh, external common external carotid artery. The nerve supply or uh, sensation of supply of the cheek of the mucosa is through the trigeminal nerve. Lymph nodes exceed uh, by the uh, facial submandibular area and deep cervical chain. This is the picture of the uh, oral cavity as we can properly uh, from up to the down, heart pellet, second uh, molar upper to parotid tract. We can see the buccal mucosa, and we are also seeing the retromolar trigon and the anterior transfer pillar and transit and lip also, as we can see uh, in this picture, pith and also buccal mucosa. Epidemiology. As we know, in our South Asia and Southern Central Europe, the commonest uh, cancer about 40% of the ischemic cell carcinoma of the cheek. Especially in the Pakistan, it is going about uh, of the 32% of the all the cancer uh, which uh, suffers the people in that area. Male to female ratio, best male to female ratio in the East. Uh, male to female is equal in the best, but into male to female in the east, it is a 4 into 1. Typically, over it, uh, the uh, patients who are, are present about the 40 years old, and smoking is also a predisposing factor in the Europe and in the South Asia area. As we discussed, a lot of multiple factors, which is also a uh, uh, predisposing factor of the carcinoma of the chick. Epidemiology, alcohol, a lot of people uh, uh, use of uh, alcohol multiple times and, and the chronic history of that area, tobacco uses, as we know, tobacco, we are using in the palm, chalia, putka, and other things, and, and the smoking area. As we know, the better luck and leaves in our society like Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh, uh, South. Uh, uh, Southeast Asia is uh, multiple people are uses uh, habitual to use uh, better than and live. And also a uh, pretty malignant oral cavity lesion like in lycopelagia, erythropelagia, SNF, which is also epidemiologic as well. Bad oral hygiene. And we know in our society, our, uh, our uh, country region, a lot of people they are not using the toothbrush in the morning and they are not care about their oral hygiene. And the one human papilloma virus, especially 16 and 18, which is, which is also an epidemiological infection. And we, uh, and we also include in that area is the Naswar. A lot of people are using the Naswar daily basis, multiple times they are using and putting in the one place of, of that area. Presentation. 
A patient came to us with a complaint, uh, or the, he said there is an ulcer or there is a growth he, he feels in the cheek when he is eating, when he is biting, when he is uh, spit out something, then he feels uh, there is an ulceration of growth in that area. What he can feel? He feels uh, oral sourceness, patient feels a particular area, and, uh, is, and sometimes uh, there is a localized area, he feels uh, there is a uh, soreness and sometimes when he is swimming he feels a pain the pain sometimes he might or sometimes an aggressive nature sometimes patient complains difficult to open the mouth patient complains he can't open the mouth during the eating meal or sometimes uh, when he want to uh, use a brush uh, special put brush and uh, cleaning uh, their teeth especially in the morning Sometimes he feel, he also complain of the ulceration. Uh, when he saw a multiple time in the mirror, uh, they check he feel there is an ulceration, uh, but unilaterally or bilaterally uh, the check. Or sometimes patient complain of <laughs> there is a mass in the oral cavity, mass or growth, a skin lesion. Sometimes he says uh, he feel uh, a few days, few months ago there is ulceration in the inside the check, and now he feels. Uh, the skin lesion of which may be across uh, involved by skin. And sometimes patient uh, and sometimes patient complains of the lymph node, even a uh, unilateral side or even a bilateral side. He feels there is a lump or swelling inside the submandibular area, into the cervical chain or uh, into the other area of the body. So this is the picture of the uh, car. Uh, uh, growth of the cheek, patient complaint, as we, as we, can, say, as we, as we can see properly, uh, there is a uh, lesion inside the cheek, as we say, in the opposite, uh, near to the tooth and near to the, uh, there is a small paper amount of uh, area in the cheek. This is also a, another picture, we can see it, there is ulceration, white, uh, white patches are seen. Uh, in that area, and the hygiene of the tooth, uh, tooth is not good. And the, in the opposite effect, the, there is a small papilloma type or a small growth can be uh, we can see in this picture. These are the picture when the tumor is involved into the skin. We can see properly the disfiguration of the face and uh, swelling around the leaf, swelling around the swelling, uh, arrhythmia or seen, and there is a Another picture we can see there is a lump field of the lump in the neck or in the submandibular area. Experience of Prashi Care Hospital of Karachi objected to assist the frequency clinical presentation and associate risk factors for the patient with the carcinoma of the cheek who present into the KPNC. The study is an analytic, analytically cross section study uh, from 2018 to 2020 done in JPMC, in the department JPMC Karaj. Method. WHO sample size calculator, confidential interval 95%, sample size uh, 30 patients, sampling technique, non probability and convenience sampling, data analysis, SPSS version 10.0, uh, Chai Square Fisher's exit test uh, episodes. Apply significant p value less than 0 0.05. Inclusion criteria we are including that whose patient was a non healing ulcer for more than four weeks. Less than four weeks, we are not included in this study. No age and gender discrimination. Positive biopsy was a patient. Uh, we have advised biopsy and biopsy. Reports comes out of either ischemic cell carcinoma, the cheek then included in this study. Patient with a dental history of smoking, habits, addiction, histories, and and also family histories of the malignancy, these are patients included in this study. Total number of patients of the carcinoma, as we just discussed, 30 patients, about out of which we have uh, about uh, uh, 3 30 patients, about 21 patients, 75 percent of uh, patients have carcinoma of the cheek, as we can see. Men, uh, about 
78 to 0.70% patients as we can the mean age of the uh, patient as we discussed previously about 40 family history about 2.8 percent features as you know uh, the smoker urban roller employed married and addiction smokers over 84 percent urban roller 97 percent roller 72 percent employed 87 percent and married 85 percent and addiction person 85 percent as we know the urban and uh, more common in that study Conclusion, carcinoma of the other presented with a non-healing ulcer from more than four weeks. It's a more common in male. It's common with the people in urban area. It's common with the smoking positive addiction history and positive family history of addiction. Significance, large scale clinical studies may help to spread awareness in the community and the local population to promote and pre prevention and early Recognition and diagnosis, and in the time management to improve the prognosis of the patient with the carcinoma of the chain. These are the reference. This is my study, and um, these are the references. And thank you very much. Have uh, any question regarding the carcinoma of the chain and presentation and presentation and incidents? Uh, can you have a question with me? I am available to answer you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abdul Razak Dogur, for giving such an uh, extensive uh, information about uh, CA cheeks and uh, cheek and oral cavity tumors. And I hope that would be a great help for the community to understand the importance of preventions and uh, community propagations for the to decrease the prevalences of CA cheek. Nowadays, uh, we all know that um, that uh, we are having a lot of allergies uh, all over the city and the things which are making the global change in the weather and the way the pollution is getting on. All the societies are suffering a lot of ailments in which the particular ailment which we are suffering from here is the allergy and infections of the nose and the paranasal sinuses. So uh, we are having abundant of patients uh, who are simply suffering from nasal obstructions due to the rhinitis, which can be allergic, or which is extending up to the complications leading to some polyps and growths, which is not only involving the nasal cavity, but extending to the paranasal sinuses and can extend to go to the vital structures around, which uh, one of the most important is the eye. So the lot of importance of vision as uh, the very important sense so it, that is in danger the thing a lot of uh, world is is expanding and uh, the things are increasing so the technologies are increasing also and the expertise expertise people are developing to decrease the ailments suffered from these diseases the one of the leading hospital in Karachi is the Lakhat National Hospital, which is a teaching institute also, getting a lot of burden of patients and the people there are serving a lot to the humanity and to the populations of Karachi and abroad. So the anti-departments there is also very much busy. And uh, one of the pillar of uh, the anti-department of Lakhat National Hospital is uh, Dr. Ahmed Nawaz. Dr. Ahmed Nawaz has got a great experience for working in different uh, hospitals of Karachi and dealing with a lot of people from every community of aspects of uh, the society. So now today he is working, uh, nowadays he's working and serving as an associate professor of uh, Lakhat National Hospital, ENT department, which not only doing and serving the people, but also teaching and producing more doctors to help the community. His today is going to talk about one of the complications of uh, the allerg allergy, nail nose of the nose and perinatal sinuses, that is optic nerve decompression, which is very much, very much, uh, I would say, as a part of uh, expertise 
and very delicate surgeries. So I would like to invite uh, Dr. Ahmad Nawaz to please come and uh, deliver us his lectures. Thank you very much. Most welcome, Dr. Ahmad Nawaz, please. Uh, I'm Dr. Ahmad Nawaz, Associate Professor at Lehakat National Hospital Medical College. Uh, since the introduction of uh, endoscope in the ENT and especially in the uh, doing the procedure of nose and nasal cavity, initially it was just used for the examination, then for power lip and then for removing the tumor. And the, as uh, we are exploring the field, we are using it more and more and uh, now doing the different procedure like optic nerve decompression. Uh, so I'll discuss today. This is uh, the overview of my presentation. We will start with the anatomy of the optic nerve, uh, go through the etiology, clinical presentation, diagnostic tools used, management of the disease. We will leave, review the literature and surgical approaches of the optic nerve decompression. Uh, this is the case uh, which uh, mainly uh, uh, forced me to uh, work on this topic. And uh, uh, this was a 45-year-old female presented uh, in my clinic with the complaint of uh, uh, right, uh, left-sided uh, decreased vision along when left-sided nasal discharge with obstruction. Uh, on clinical presentation, there was a first coming out from the, uh, or the, the, the right, left eye and the nose. Uh, there was complete ophthalmoplegia and uh, hardly perception of light, which patient can only uh, perceive in dark room. So with this uh, case, what uh, we did with that lady, before going to that, I'll discuss the anatomy uh, of this optic nerve. And optic nerve is primarily the extension of the brain. It is not the true nerve, which is enveloped by the three meningeal layers. And it has four anatomical segments. Uh, that is the intraorbital section of one millimeter, uh, intraocular section of one millimeter, intraorbital section of 25 millimeter, canalicular section of nine millimeter, and finally the intracranial 16 millimeter length. And we can approach all the portion with simple endoscope. Uh, the relation of the nerve with the artery is very important. Uh, most of the time, the, in 85% of the cases, the artery is located in furo, in furo medial, uh, inferior lateral to the nerve in 85% of cases. While, so we are doing the optic nerve decompression. So also the artery is lateral to the, to, to the nerve. So it's safe that there will be no chance of um, le or less chances of uh, trauma to the artery. Uh, Annulus is a fibrous ring in which all three meningeal layer are inserted. So optic neuropathy can be divided into the traumatic and non-traumatic. Among the traumatic, the primary, that is the rupture or contusion or distortion of the optic nerve, and the secondary, that is the nerve edema. Uh, there are tumor conditions which can co also cause this, and the non-tumorous condition like inflammatory. Uh, which can cause optic neuropathy or optic nerve compression. Traumatic optic neuropathy uh, may also be caused by fibrous osseous. Uh, there are traumatic optic neuropathy and the non-traumatic that the tumors like the fibro osseous lesion and the other neoplasm like size nasal tumor, meningioma, or bill apex tumor. There are also chances of vision loss because of secondary to idiopathic intracranial hypertension, but in that case, I think the shunting of the, uh, the, the uh, cerebrospinal fluid is more important or more appropriate as compared to uh, simple uh, optic nerve decompression. Inflammatory disorder can also ca uh, cause this, like the inflammation, uh, Wagner's or sinusitis complication or invasive fungal sinusitis or allergic fungal sinusitis. Uh, patient present with the uh, primary history of the disease. If there is trauma, there could be history of direct or indirect trauma. Uh, if there is the, this is the complication of sinusitis, there, are, there is history of, sin, of, of sin, uh, symptoms of sinusitis. Uh, clinical presentation include the uh, orbital pain, blurring or vision or double vision, peripheral vision loss, slow or intermittent 
uh, or it could it could be sudden vision loss uh, so if it's the slow uh, there is the chronic disease but if it's the, the, the sudden mostly it's in the, occurred in the trauma examination show up failed disc on fundoscopic examination and visual acuity is reduced uh, the relative apparent pupillary defect will be found in these cases a uh, visual field defect could also be found the first sign is the loss of color vision uh, uh, intraocular pressure is generally raised in these conditions and restricted eye movement as in uh, case, case which i also discussed along with the prophylaxis investigation include the anatomic evaluation as well as the functional evaluation anatomic evaluation is the ct scan and with the mri that is the radiology functional there are electrophysiological testing which are in which include the visual evocopotential and electroretinography radiology you can appreciate here the nerve so you, one can see the lesion here and this is the mri axial view and this is the lesion compressing the nerve visual evoc evoc potential is the neurological testing in which uh light uh stimulus is given intense light stimulus in fact and uh, the uh, occipital occipital area recording uh, are done with the electrode it could be the flesh web or pattern reversal web uh, so it's a good uh, technique to identify the neuropathy and uh, also the the viability of the nerve Uh, the treatment in start with the medical uh, there are role of questionable role of steroid in fact uh, uh, the, uh, the steroid is now more controversial uh, uh, the basic idea was started with the uh, use in the trauma of the spinal cord uh, but even in those cases now it's discontinued uh, but for the eye uh, optic nerve neuropathy people still advocate use uh, steroid and uh, another is the nerve growth factor for the surgical option uh, the endoscopic approach we'll discuss the approach later on timing of the uh, decompression is very important uh, this is the study uh, this is a uh, uh, study uh, in fact the literature uh, the, the systemic review done over 24 studies uh, and uh, in this uh, they divide this time of surgery into 3 4 to 7 days and more than 7 days and also divide the vision testing into the no light perception light perception hand motion and finger counting uh they group all 24 studies and they also divide the time of decompression into less than 3 days that is 57 uh and more than 7 days as i discussed uh, so what they found that uh, if the time of decompression is less than 3 days uh, in 57% of uh, patient showed improvement while in more than 7 days 51% of the patient showed improvement uh, there was also important thing that is the residual vision uh, in cases of finger counting and hand movement and light perception there are more chances of improvement as compared to in patient with uh, no per, no light perception this is another study uh, regarding the outcome of endoscopic transesophageal spinal optic nerve canal decompression for in direct traumatic optic neuropathy uh, this that was this was a retrospective study done on 96 per uh, patient had traumatic optic neuropathy all the cases received the methyl prednisolone and nerve growth factor for 3 days and in patient whose visual acuity showed no improvement uh, they uh, went for optic nerve decompression ct scan on web of all patient was done they all uh, there were total 147 patient in which 96 patient proceeded for the surgery so they included only uh, they studied only 96 which uh, which consented for the surgery 
they followed the patient for next three months after the surgery again they also divided into three group that is the less than three days three to seven days and more than seven days the success rate was highest if the compression was done on fourth day that is uh, less than three three to four days that was 63.6 percent in three to seven per uh, days group 42.9 percent patient showed improvement while in more than uh, in group of more than seven days only 35.7 percent showed improvement so the time factor is important uh, in cases of optic nerve decompression or uh, time of surgery is important they also uh, did the uh, visual level potential to see the uh, nerve level or atrophy level and in atrophy group when there is no uh, signal over the web uh, only 25 percent patient showed improvement while in non-atrophy group 51.3 percent showed improvement so visual level potential or other electrophysiological testing showed us the nerve level or nerve atrophy uh, which can help us to predict the outcome among the non traumatic group i have not found any large study this was a literature review uh, done on uh, 10 to 11 studies and in the, in these cases uh, in that study only one study was of 21 patients and another for of 11 patients so uh, but the important thing what they concluded that the you can appreciate here that in most of the cases although there are some only case reports most of the cases optic nerve decompression improve the prognosis Limitation of this study was they haven't uh, mentioned about the level of improvement or degree of improvement, but is still uh, all these studies show improvement. So if one want to go for the optic nerve decompression, then the question is what surgical approach is the best? There are orbital approaches, which include the medial transconjunctival approach. Most of the ophthalmologists use this or superior medial lid crease incision approach and the least used is the lateral orbitotomy approach the important thing is they go through the orbit and it's very difficult to approach the intracranial or intracranial portion through this approach what they do, do they make a fenestra over here in the orbital part and from that part there will be some release of the CSF, which ultimately decrease the pressure around the nerve. So uh, orbital approaches has limitation to approach the intracanalicular part, which is in fact is the part which should be decompressed and narrowest part. Neurosurgeons are also doing this using the intracranial approaches uh, that are the perional approaches, front orbital approaches, front orbital zygomatic approaches, or the supra orbital approaches. You can see here that is the perional approach. But still, one has to go intracranially and retract the brain to approach the optic nerve. Endosophic. Ethimado is friendly approach. Most of us who do the endoscopic surgery can easily identify the optic nerve in the sphenoid sinus, that is the carotid artery, the optic nerve, the keratoptic recess, which is star. This is my own case. I am doing this optic nerve decompression, egg shelling the optic nerve with a lot of irrigation. 
to avoid nerve trauma this is the orbit orbit so in these cases first of all you ex exhale the nerve just like in the ear we we, we do in the ear for facial nerve and then remove the thin bone with the periosteum elevator making the fenestra if the disease is extra cranial and you remove the medial wall of the the, the optic canal so uh, in those cases i usually don't make the fenestra but if the disease is intra cranial in those cases to re, i used to do the uh, make the fenestra in the meninges this is the same that is the orbital fat you can appreciate the optic nerve completely here and the here is the carotid artery this is a safe procedure uh, in expert hand and the complication rate is 4 to 9% severe complication report, reported in the literature include the carotid artery bleeding csf leak vision deterioration cavernous sinus hemorrhage uh, uh, this is the study by dhaliwal which also reported this cavernous sinus hemorrhage which also uh, uh, he managed by pressing and packing so optic nerve decompression is a safe procedure and if you, uh, uh, in conclusion i can say that early intervention predicts the better result better preoperative uh, preoperative vision increase the chances for improvement and degree of improvement patient with duration of more than 7 days should also be assessed for optic nerve viability via electrophysiological testing and if you find, one will find the sign of viability then should go and give the chance visual evoc potential can be used uh, in, uh, in 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 cases even in nlp case uh, no perception of um, if there is no light perception because uh, this they use the intense light so in even if there is slight perception of light even on those cases the, the potential potential electrical potential recordable endoscopic transvenal approach is a safe and effective method of optic nerve decompression and timely decision making is the main key this is a team approach which needs ophthalmologists otolaryngologists neurologists because to reduce the time one has to approach uh, as early, uh, otolaryngology should be approached as early as possible in my institution i am making all the effort to educate my ophthalmologists neuro neurosurgeon trauma people er that if there are case such cases inform us as soon as possible so that we can intervene early this is the case which i showed the picture in on uh, uh, in the uh, start of my presentation and that patient finally final diagnosis showed the wegner granulomatosis and now her vision is uh, completely uh, uh, vision is normal uh, and uh, eye movements also became normal you can you can see both the eyes the, the similar eyes and uh, my reward thank you very much thank you very much uh, dr uh, ahmad nawaz uh, for the beautiful presentation on a very important topic uh, which you have elaborated now uh, we all are very sure about that that uh, this uh, uh, presentations would be a great help for the community and for the learners also and the people would encourage to go ahead for uh, to attempt this decompression after a good training so uh, the our sessions all our presenters have presented their cases their uh, speeches and uh, now we would like to open the panel for uh, the question answers and uh, discussions okay so um, I would like to get the people from any questions somebody is having. Okay, so uh, I would uh, like to take an opportunity to uh, be as the first to want to ask the question. Uh, I would uh, like uh, Dr. Anjum Nuvaid. Uh, uh, Dr. Anjum, are you are you hearing me? Are you with me now? Uh, because I can't see uh, the picture 
Dr. Anjum Naveed and Dr. Asif Parani. Yeah, no, Dr. Asif Parani. Can I assalamu alaikum? Dr. Anjum Naveed, are, are you here? Hello? Can you Hello? hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you, but your picture is not coming very clear. Uh, you want to see my picture? Definitely, why not? <laughs> we, knew, we need to know that. Uh, you, how are you now? Uh, yes, I'm uh, fine now. Alhamdulillah, is better. Uh, just, just a minute. So let me get up. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, so, yes, so let, uh, maybe you can see my picture. You, you know that uh, without seeing, only hearing is is very deficient. Sure, sure. So sure. we should all use all our senses now, yeah, yeah, <laughs> as yeah. much as possible. Vision and listen. <laughs> yep. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, you, Dr. Anjum Nivet, for just elaborating this new technique for our the technique for this uh, approach to the mastoids. The question I like to ask you is that that uh, despite of just getting um, or by this approach of uh, inside out, just getting a small cavity and a quick uh, surgical procedure, what are the other advantages you think uh, it is? Yes, uh, first of all, uh, I will say that you are the best moderator I have ever seen, uh, giving good introduction of the speakers and details of the talks. So thank you very much, Dr. Shakir. Uh, it was a wonderful session. And uh, you really introduced everyone with a uh, very nice way. Uh, well, uh, uh, there are a lot of advantages. I mean, you see the disease of uh, middle ear, the clastotoma progresses from middle ear to the attic, to the editors, and then to the editor. So if you follow the disease from its origin, then it is very easy for you to clear the disease and you do the limited job where, where when, the, when you finish the sac, remove the sac of the cholesterol and you see behind the sac the, the healthy bone, then you stop the procedure. And number two, the cavity is small, so I uh, said that I always take bone dust and most of the time I put the bone dust and the cavity become really very small. And sometimes uh, we put the flap, the inferior base uh, periosteal flap. So there are, I mean, if you do from posterior to anterior, then you have to do, do full-blown cortical mastectomy, remove the healthy cells, and then you go towards the middle ear. So that most of the time creates big cavity and sometimes you face big cavity problems in future. So that is why I like this approach. Okay, fine. Uh, the other thing is that uh, you're very passionate about tympanoplast. Uh, this is myotoplasties in particular. So could you just elaborate us with different uh, methods and uh, some of the things which can the people learn? So particularly the importance of the myotoplasties and the different techniques which you are using it. Yes, uh, I actually have done uh, different methods, but I found that uh, <clears throat> if you remove a semilunar, some part of uh, conical cartilage, and that, uh, and so that at least you can put your little finger inside the meters, that gives you enough idea that uh, your meters is enlarged. And then you take out this uh, cartilage and then cover the, car uh, the rest of the conical cartilage with the skin so that there are less chances of perichondritis. And you see, the if you make a cavity, you have to clean the cavity in future. You have to check the cavity for recurrence of the cluster toma. And plus, uh, I always lower the posterior metal wall, uh, the ridge, facial ridge, down. So that uh, gives, first of all, good aeration. Aeration is very important. The air, uh, uh, I think, is a very good, has a very good healing factor. And then with this uh, good metoplasty, you can inspect your uh, mastoid cavity very easily. If there's any wax collection or is there any debris collection, you can remove in future. And uh, but the only the problem is that the meters is a bit enlarged, and the patients sometimes uh, complain of some cosmetic uh, problem. But I tell them 
you want cosmosis or you want health so they agree for with me and they they like it they don't complain again so this metoplasty with this technique i found it's very useful uh, okay so what other techniques you have also tried for yes i tried um, i mean um, not to remove the conical cartilage and uh, um, i mean um, uh, uh, less conical cartilage but uh, uh, in my opinion when i tried this technique i stopped other techniques and this gave me very good results okay uh, i would just uh, dr asaf is there so i'd like to take a chance to uh, get something from him is uh, particularly dr asaf congratulations for establishing such a good department of ENT here in the Indus hospital and establishing a very good program for the cochlear implant which is uh, not only progressing but uh, the, uh, the one thing i just um, deliberately stopped so that we can take it in the discussion is that you are also has a dream to establish cochlear implant program in the whole country because uh, our country is very backwards and a lot of people who cannot afford it so you are just struggling for this program to establish and uh, the thing is that you are also mentoring other people for uh, uh, preparing them for uh, being as a cochlear implant surgeons you are going to different uh, parts of the countries and uh, you're just assisting and arranging the things there so how do you my question is that that how do you look about the future of uh, cochlear implant program in Pakistan. Uh, are you are you getting me, Dr. Asa? Uh, okay, okay. So I think there's some connection problem or delays there. So, uh, Dr. Anjum Naveed, are you with me now? Yes, I'm with you. Uh, did you hear my question about? So you all were also involved in the in the cochlear implant program in the Indus hospitals, and uh, you're the one who sowed the seeds of cochlear implant in the Indus hospital. So how do you see the program uh, nowadays now, particularly regarding to the cochlear implant program in the Indus hospital? Yeah. Y yes, uh, Alhamdulillah, cochlear implant is progressing in all our in our, all over the country. And uh, I can see that a lot of uh, new cochlear implant surgeons are coming up. And uh, Dr. Asif, I think he, he is the, uh, did all his best efforts to learn this surgery. And then he's, mashallah, uh, almost doing all over the country this procedure. So I'm sure we have a very bright future for cochlear implant in our country. As uh, I have seen, I've done a few courses outside, visited many departments in Western America. Um, and I can see they there now they have no contraindication for cochlear implant and even they are going to brain brain stem implant so the people who have uh, non functioning cochlea they go to the brain stem so this field is becoming is progressing day by day with the uh, size of the cochlear implant with the approaches for the cochlear implant and uh, i was really very surprised to know that even in uk where my lot of friends are there they are saying that they are closing their uh, deaf, uh, the sign language schools because there's no deaf school now. So uh, the government is so much sponsoring this program there. So anyone who uh, born with the profound hearing loss or anyone who get post-lingual hearing loss, they will get cochlear implant from the state. So I'm sure one day will come when our government and our states and uh, provision pro provisional governments they will uh, see they will feel the importance of this program and they will um, sponsor our poor uh, patients to have this implant because after getting this uh, uh, treatment the children can go to normal school they can have a normal future in uh, in their life and they can be as professional as a as a normal child so they will, there will be less burden on society and they will get the equal chance of progressing and building their future. So uh, I'm quite optimistic, inshallah, in future. Uh,
progress more in our country and there will more institute will come up like in this hospital in which uh, under one roof we are uh, we have established this department giving all the services free of cost starting from neonatal hearing screen for every every newborn born in our maternity home and then auto acoustic emission brain stem uh, vocal response audiometry screening bara audiometry tympanometry and then uh, we do all the psychological assessments and everything so the patient get comprehensive treatment and not only the cochlear implant then we also provide them free post op services as well because this is another very important issue you do cochlear implant and after few years if the cochlear implant or processor is not working then the child will go again zero so this is also very important uh, companies will come forward to ensure these implants for their life so that uh, once we have implanted uh, the child will not get problem or any hurdle uh, in his in his future and the other thing is that maybe in future we'll come up with bilateral cochlear implant if suppose due to any reason one implant is not working at least the child will not become again handicapped so there are a lot of uh, future lot of uh, options lot of uh, i mean uh, uh, things to be need to be progress but uh, i'm very sure now this has been started and i'm very optimistic inshallah it will improve day by day progress day by day more cochlear implant surgeons will come in the field and take over this projects in different hospitals particularly under government uh, in government institutes so that all the society all the socio economic group can benefit their children with the latest device which is a miracle of 20 21st century thank you very much uh, dr anjum now i would like to take another um, questions dr ahmed nawaz our speaker he is uh, there's some failure for that uh, connection so we are taking him on the phone dr anjum with so uh, प्लीज कहिए हेलो जी सुन रहे हैं आपको जी जी अच्छा 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 सही डॉक्टर अहमद नवाज आप थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर दिस थिंग इज दैट फॉर रिगार्डिंग टू योर कंसर्न अबाउट दिस ऑप्टिकल ऑफ द कंप्रेशन I just like to know about that. Uh, uh, are you frequently dealing with the traumatic uh, uh, orbit nerve decompressions in your hospital, and uh, uh, what is your experience in that? To, to 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 inform us in those cases our results are encouraging uh, but the main hurdle is uh, the late reporting of the patient uh, in uh, especially in traumatic cases and uh, secondly uh, the the uh, other specialty of pulmonology and neurology are not very well aware of the things that ent people or otolaryngologists are the right person to deal with these problems Uh, but yes, if the patient uh, reported early, then definitely we have encouraged the patient. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, doctor. Uh, so, wh- what do you think is this? Uh, uh, what is the correct time to start intervening uh, in the patients who are suffering from these other diseases, not trauma, to uh, start the intervention? Uh, the answer is not very much clear. uh because if you, when you see hello because when you see that uh, in, in uh, the, the case studies which i quoted in the presentation uh, that more there, there are only few studies uh, with very small uh, case series uh, but yes uh, the the uh, the time is if it below uh, less than 3 days you will have encouraging results and in addition to that if you will find the uh, the the, the viable nerve on the visual evoked potential 
it also give you the uh, the and the, uh, the, the good result uh, some people also do uh, the the decompression in cases where the nerve is not viable uh, but in uh, uh, although small series but in one case they found on results only slight improvement only 35 to 40 percent of the cases uh, so uh, the uh, optimum time is uh, the less than three days but uh, even after the three days if you find some uh, some response on the web visual evoke potential one should go for decompression okay so as far as in our community this um, fungal sinus disease is very common so what is your experience for uh, uh, this fungal sinus disease infiltrating and uh, causing this effects on the uh, optic nerve which needs decompression uh, in in uh, allergic fungal sinusitis, it's uh, not uh, very much cases of the allergic fungal sinus, but in invasive fungal, especially the aspergillus, uh, we have series of the, uh, even those those cases. And uh, in those cases, if you properly decompress the nerve, you will find the result. Uh, uh, in 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 cases where the disease is uh, half treated. That is the initially treated with the fungal load initially treated with the with the antifungal uh, antibiotic. In those cases, we have difficulty to to decompress those nerves because of the fibrosis. But in cases where patient initially report report to you and you first decide to debulk the disease or uh, remove the disease as much as possible and then uh, go for antifungal, uh, uh, mostly the very conosal then the, 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 you, you will find the result of improvement in the visual equity of the patient. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ahmad Nawaz. Uh, thank you. Okay, one, one question from Dr. Ahmad Nawaz. Can I do? Uh, he's out. He's away. Ahmad Nawaz. Uh, okay. Connection. Yeah, just hold on, uh, please. We are just trying to make a connection with uh, Dr. Ahmad Nawaz so that uh, he can hear and... Jim uh... Navid is uh, willing to ask you a question, please. Are you with uh, me? Dr. Ahmad, uh, can you hear me? Hello, Dr. Ahmad. Can you hear me? Yeah, Dr. Ahmad Namaz, are you with us? I, I can hear you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. yeah, Dr. Ahmad, uh, thank you very much for your uh, excellent presentation. And uh, no doubt, uh, vision is more important than hearing. Equally, both are equally important, but the vision I will give plus one more. Uh, so, uh, do, do you have any experience of uh, orbital de not orbit uh, orbital decompression in uh, thyrotoxicosis? Hello. Hello, Jay. Uh, yeah, Dr. Anjum Navid is uh, just appreciating your works and just is like uh, is willing to know about that uh, in thyrotoxicosis. Is the is you are you having any experience for decompressing or are you going for decompression of the optic nerve in thyrotoxicosis patients who are having some effects on the vision? Please. Uh, uh, I'm thyrotoxicosis, I, I uh, didn't do any case. But uh, the in thyrotoxicosis, the main issue is the the volume of uh, in the orbit. Uh, because of that, there is stretch over the uh, nerve. So in thyrotoxicosis, uh, toxicosis cases, the aim is to to uh, decompress the orbit rather to decompress the nerve. Uh, and the compromise in the visual equity in thyrotoxicosis is because of the uh, anterior stretch. There's the uh, volume increases, the globe try to go outward or anteriorly. Because of that, there is the stretch over the nerve. And that is the cause of that. So in, in those cases, 
the simplest way is just to remove the medial wall of the orbit and there uh, there is no need for optic nerve decompression in those cases because in the optic canal there is uh, mostly mostly there is no problem in those cases okay uh, 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 did you get the answer, Dr. Junavid, please? Uh, yes, thank you very much. Yes, yes, sure. Uh, okay. So, uh, just, uh, I think we are just heading towards the closure of the session. So, uh, just I would, because of there's some connection problem is there, I would uh, like to just uh, continue with Dr. Anjum Nivedh about uh, the uh, for uh, not for the approach I'm talking about for uh, the mastoids exploration and removal of the disease from the middle air. The thing is uh, what I'm concerned about the hearing restoration because uh, eradication of the disease is uh, what we are doing here. But what, just like to know your experience about uh, the restoration of hearing in people with chronic separative diabetes media or those who has undergone mastoidectomies. Yes, uh, this is a very good question because uh, uh, before people were doing two-stage procedures, they do eradicate the disease and then they do uh, the ossical plasty or something. But uh, I found that in this uh, approach which I'm doing, I can um, uh, remove the disease and uh, most of the time I'm sure that I've almost removed the disease. Then I, um, I reconstruct the ossicular system with the Conchal cartilage, which usually we take during uh, our conco uh, conchoplasty, so that we can, we can most of the time we found that uh, the head of the stapes is there with suprastructure. So I put one uh, type sheet type of uh, cartilage uh, under the remnant of the eardrum, and then I put a small piece of uh, uh, another full thickness cartilage on the head of the stapes. Um, Sometimes need to do some hole but otherwise most of the time it is double cartilage graft and it works and uh, the patients they come after the surgery and if they they are very happy they said oh yes now i can hear my mobile so then I'll, i'm also very happy so that at least he is getting a useful hearing the problem is that our audio our audiogram system our audiometry system uh, most of the time we don't have uh, soundproof rooms but uh, we do, after three months, uh, the audiometry and compare the results pre-op and post-op. And if uh, most of the time uh, we reduce the airborne gap 20 to 30 decibel, and the patient is very subjective. If the patient is saying that he can hear it and he can, you know, because they, the mobile is so essential now, they are very happy even if they can hear the mobile. But uh, I will say that no, uh, we cannot uh, close completely the airborne gap with this technique, but at least we can give a useful hearing to the patient so he can avoid hearing aid. So there are different uh, scenarios. Sometimes we don't have a uh, uh, foot plate. Uh, we have only the foot plate. And at that, that time, we can put some uh, cartilage in the stirt on the foot plate and put the uh, sort of a, um, um, shield graft under the tympanic membrane. It also works very well. Uh, but uh, the, still the thing is that we don't have torp and port so that uh, we cannot give the exact, uh, uh, I mean, complete uh, um, uh, normal hearing to the patient. But I will say with this technique, most of the time the patient has useful hearing and is very happy with his normal life. Thank you very much uh, for this elaborative answer, Dr. Anjumanavid. So, uh, Dr. Asif Rani is, is, uh, has reconnected. So, I would like uh, the opportunity to ask him the same questions which I just uh, started. Uh, is that, uh, Dr. Asif, are you hearing me, please? Are you hearing me, Dr. Asif? Hello? Uh, are you hearing? Hello? Hello? Dr. Asif, are you hearing me, please? So, uh, I'd like to 
take an opportunity to take him on phone. Hello? Yeah, Dr. Asif, are you hearing us? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was just asking a question with this connection, I couldn't, is that uh, regarding to the um, cochlear implant program you have established and running now in the in this hospital is, and you are also mentoring to the uh, other people in all over the countries, so you want to establish the uh, program for the for benefiting the our country and populations. So, uh, what, regarding your efforts, I asked is that uh, that how much you are satisfied with your uh, obsession for cochlear implantation, and what do you see in future for Pakistan? Thank you, Doctor. Very well organized and very well moderated. Uh, really impressed by your uh, verbal skills. Uh, yes, the uh, question uh, is that okay, how we are establishing the cochlear implant system in Pakistan. So, uh, I am uh, basically struggling for that. Still, uh, the basic problem with the cochlear implant uh, uh, program is funding. So, uh, the, 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 all you know that the cost of the cochlear implant is around uh, in Pakistan, you see 25 to 30 lakhs. So, we are trying to establish a proper donor based program all in all over the Pakistan. And uh, my aim is to, to, to establish these programs in all four provinces, not only in Karachi, also in. Uh, with the expansion of Indus, inshallah, we are aiming for that like Muzaffargarh or Lahore, uh, we will be uh, our sec next uh, or second uh, implant center would be either Lahore or uh, Muzaffargarh. And uh, also we are expanding with the help of donor. We have a donor that uh, they are interested in uh, outreach program. So we are uh, planning for uh, this and uh, with the, <coughs> as in previously I told with the with the name of uh, Awaz, we are establishing one program, and in that program, we are we are uh, planning to do 70 to 80 implants per annum. And also, as uh, you mentioned, that uh, I'm uh, I'm trying to mentoring uh, the the people of uh, Pakistan to train as much as in the cochlear implant surgery and uh, rehab. Uh, uh, procedure. Because of that, uh, we did this all extensive uh, uh, conference uh, workshop for uh, the cochlear implant, uh, life surgery, including rehab of the cochlear implant and all this. So, this is my aim and vision and also I'm trying to get all these foreign companies who can come and uh, there should be a match in between and they should they reduce the prices of their implant. Uh, so, this is all over. Thank you, Dr. Shukri. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Asif, for all these things. And we wish you all the best. Uh, and we pray God that uh, whatever you are trying, God may help us to establish all the things which can help the poor patients of our country. Uh, thank you very much. We are on closing sessions, going, to, going towards the closure now. So oh, we had uh, in our discussions to conclude just is a very fruitful operative approaches to the um, master uh, exploration. The very road to success towards the cochlear implant and you're much aware about the things that how the things are struggling and how the things are progressing. The thing which is required to know and is the prevalences and to decrease the incidences of the uh, oral cancers, we need to educate the people and to tell the community about the toxicity and uh, to tell them the ways to prevent it. And uh, finally, the uh, things which is progressing and getting too much forwards uh, in the field of uh, functional endoscopic sinus surgeries and the technologies which is expanding. And we do have people who are not only doing it, but also they are ready to mentor the, the expertise and to train the people. So uh, I just uh, uh, thank you all for uh, uh, being with us and has uh, given your precious time in the day of uh, your uh, uh, luxuries. Today is Sunday and to attend with us is, is really an honor for us. 
So from the depth of my heart, I just thank you from all of you and uh, uh, be there. And thanks and God bless us and in this hospital. Thank you very much. Thank you.